I've been out of action for weeks. I had pneumonia, and my daughter and her husband had to nurse me like a child. After that, for quite a while, I had no voice, little energy and much work to catch up on. While recuperating, I watched some of the early episodes. When I started this channel, I'd been lecturing all over the world for 30 years, but never made anything for YouTube. So, the first few were very amateurish. I'd replaced some long ago, but I saw that the response to Dawkins needed replacing too. The new version was uploaded last week. While it was uploading, I looked for comments on the channel. It was so long since I'd uploaded anything, I didn't expect much to respond to. But there was such a lot, it took three days to work through it. And before I could finish, many new comments arrived. I want to thank the skeptics who raised some very interesting points. And I want to thank the supporters who stepped in with answers. Some of the threads were a week or two of robust debate. The comments make it clear there's a lot of confusion about evolution and its relation with the second law of thermodynamics. And Morgan Jensen asked if I could do a video on Arthur Wilder Smith, one of the greatest creation scientists of the last hundred years. A wonderful idea. Many of the comments appear to have come from people who've studied or are studying biology. When I studied biology, the second law of thermodynamics wasn't mentioned. I learned about it in a course on thermodynamics at Manchester University. The establishment has worked hard to brainwash everybody that to speak on anything, you must have a PhD on that subject. Once upon a time, if you had a PhD, you'd learned how to find information on just about anything and make a reasoned assessment of it. But I think even the establishment would have to accept Professor Wilder Smith's suitability to speak on evolution and the second law. He had three earned PhDs, one in organic chemistry, one in biochemistry, and one in pharmacology. He was a world-renowned scientist who did research into cancer, tuberculosis, and other diseases, and also into anaesthetics. He had many patents and published many scientific papers before he published anti-evolution literature. Then he was shunned by the establishment. He was a full professor at a number of universities, including Geneva and Chicago. Let's listen to some of Professor Wilder Smith's wisdom from an interview in the Netherlands. You're against evolution. On what basic grounds? On purely scientific grounds. Such as? There is no evidence whatsoever in any science that matter will organize itself. And the basis of evolution is that spontaneous generation took place, that matter by chemical evolution, organized itself up to the state when it could live. You must have a certain state of complexity for a molecule or molecules to live. You need at least 800 macromolecules to live. There is no evidence that matter left to itself, even when fed with energy, will organize itself up to that state of complexity, or indeed any state of complexity. So that biogenesis, spontaneous biogenesis, could not take place. Now, Pasteur proved that over a hundred years ago, that spontaneous generation did not take place. That is, the spontaneous self-organization of matter just does not occur. It's a scientific fact and uh, supported by the second law of thermodynamics. The second reason is this. That once you've produced a simple cell, there is no evidence that the complexity of that cell will increase itself spontaneously to greater uh, degrees of organization, say from amoeba up to man, because there is no biological coupling 
of metabolic energy which turns the metabolic energy of the cell into increased information. He also noted that experiments have failed to find any sign of one kind of creature changing into another. Hinchelwood proved that years ago in Oxford. He was my professor of physical chemistry. He produced millions, millions of stages of development of various bacteria in the hope of changing one bacteria into another. And he always came up against a species border which could never be crossed. And here he gives us an example of the truthfulness of what evolutionists constantly tell us. We know that the information required to build, say, the optical activity of a nucleic acid does not reside in the molecules which make up that nucleic acid. You can put the information in, but the information is exogenous and not endogenous. That is, the information to build you does not reside in the few elements of which you're made. That's the difficulty, and you can say it till the cows come home, that the information was there, and everybody knows that it isn't true, because the second law of thermodynamics denies just exactly that. He also pointed out that evolutionists know the theory is untenable, but they just can't find an alternative acceptable to the establishment. And, of course, the best in the field dictum does not allow them to abandon evolution until there is an acceptable alternative. Uh, the universal opinion today is this. Give us an alternative to the evolution theory and we'll take it. But we don't know of any alternative. And they don't want the alternative of creation because creation is unthinkable, is what they say. I've seen those words in print. The only alternative to this ridiculous theory of evolution is the unthinkable theory of creation. Well, if it's unthinkable, that's because you can't think, that's all. Next time, let's look at Professor Wilder Smith's assessment of probability and evolution. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.